Hi, and welcome to Mike's Garage. So today I'm going to show you how to parallel two 12,000 XP EG4 inverters. So as you can see, I have both of them installed. So the inverter here is the primary, and then the other one is the secondary. So the first thing you're going to do is remove a few of these screws so you can see how it's connected. The most important thing is make sure that they're on the same firmware version. It's really, really important. So I did upgrade my primary to the current version, and then I took my secondary and upgraded that as well. You want to make sure they're both on the same version. Extremely important. The other thing is it does come with a gray cable for paralleling your inverters. It is just your standard Ethernet cable. It says in the manual that you must use either that cable or reach out to G4 and they can talk you through how to basically create a longer cable. That's not needed. I think I know what they were getting at. So there's different pinouts that you can have for an Ethernet cable. There is your straight cable, which is your typical Ethernet cable. And then there's also what's known as a crossover cable. And if you're familiar with networking at all, back in the day before um, you would use a switch for this or a hub, you would have a crossover cable. Essentially, you would have the opposite on one end from the other. And essentially, you can plug into two computers together and have them communicate. So it's got to be a regular straight cable. They say Cat5 or better. I'd rather go with Cat5e or Cat6. Cat5e is a gigabit cable. Same with Cat6. 6 is going to be the best, and that's what I used here. So I have this black Ethernet cable connected where it says parallel. And then I moved it over the same on this side where it says parallel. Dip switch is really important. On your primary inverter, the two dip switches that are there are going to be in the up position. And if you only have two inverters, your second inverter is also going to be in the up position. So you can see that they're both up. There's a reason for that. You're marking the first inverter in the chain of inverters and the last one. Every inverter that would be in between, so let's just say we were looking at my other setup over here. For argument's sake, we'll call this the primary inverter. This would have both dip switches up. The next one in the chain would have both switches down. And then the final one would have both switches up. Now, if you have more than two inverters, uh, you're going to not only have to daisy chain each one together, like how I did with my two inverters there, but you're also going to have one cable from the final inverter going all the way back to the primary inverter. So that's, uh, that's important. Now, I could have used two cables on this one, and all that it would provide is essentially redundancy, and it, which isn't a bad idea, and maybe at some point I'll add a second one, but for now, this is perfectly fine. All right, so backing up, you have both inverters. They're both mounted. They're both powered on. They're on the same version of the firmware really important. You've got your cable connected up. You've got your dip switches. If you only have two inverters, they're both in the on position or facing up. Then you're going to have to do combine these outputs together. Now I'll talk about the actual software in a moment, but let's talk about how that these are combined together. So I've got my conduit and my cable. I'm using one aught aluminum going all the way across. This one is one odd aluminum. And then it goes into my combiner panel. And the combiner panel basically has two 80 amp breakers, the 200, and then the output of this goes down, around, and into my main panel. Now, I don't have this secured as of yet, 
uh, because I'm actually going to be, I'll be installing some additional equipment really soon that's on its way. So at that point, I'll be redoing this. But you have your two breakers going into here. I will have up on top mounted on this my SPD. Uh, but for now, it's these two breakers. So I'll have uh, the SPD connected uh, to the panel, and then I may have um, an outlet at the very bottom at some point. And that's just to test my output to make sure that the sine wave looks good before I energize the main panel. So you don't have to do that, but it's a good idea. I had the front of this off. So when I, you know, went to turn things on, the first thing that I did obviously was ensure that was off, of course, but I checked the sine wave on the output here before I even energized any circuit because I wanted to see what the sine wave looked like to make sure everything was good. Let's talk about something else, which is really important, which is going to be your ground neutral bond. Now, this is something that not everybody understands, and it's really important to understand. I understand most of it, but I'm going to come into a weird situation where I have these multiple systems and connected together as separate sources, in which I'll get into that later on. But when it comes to this system, you want to make sure that you're bonded at one point. So as you can see, I have, I have my ground is there, my neutral is there, same here, ground here, neutral. They're separate on both of them, so remember that. Once I get into this panel, they're still separate. Ground and neutral are separate. In my main panel, and this is where I think for my setup is the best place to bond my neutral and my ground is in here. And this is where it is bonded together. Now I'm not going to take this all off, but in here is where I bond my neutral and ground. It's very important to bond them at only one location. So that's where I do it. So each one of these are separate. Okay. Now, completely separate. And sometimes people get confused the difference between ground neutral bond and grounding your inverters to the frame of your building or structure and to the actual ground using your grounding rods. I have two grounding rods that are connected and it goes up through here and connects right on this inverter, my primary. My secondary inverter does not have its own ground rod because it's using these two. Because when you look at it, you have your ground right here. You have your ground right here. And in this panel here, I have my two grounds, one from each of these, and then also connected to my main panel is a ground. And it's all on one ground bar on this right hand side inside here. Take your time, make sure you do it right. You got to make sure that when you're bonding, that you bond at one point and your main service panel, I don't want to say is the best point, but it's usually a good place to, to do that instead of on the inverters. And like I said, it really depends on your setup. And if you're not sure, talk to an electrician because... You want to make sure that it's bonded correctly. You do not want to have a floating neutral. That is extremely important. That's really bad if you have a floating neutral. You want to make sure that you have that bond between your ground and your neutral. 
All right, so enough on that. So you can see how I have everything wired up. As far as to the batteries, so these are connected to the same bank. Uh, so these are 24 volt batteries, each one, each pair is in series. So there's 12 pairs. And then they go up to 12 T-class fuses, which then go into my bus bars, which then are connected together. And then they go into these fuses, which are also T-class, but they're better T-class, and then go into the inverter. So I'm using 4 out cable, 4 slash 0. Very important that you either use a pair of 2 out cables or a single 4 out. I use a single four out, so I would need less fuses. Reasons for the fuses. So let me explain this. I have a lot of batteries. The more batteries that you have, the more of a chance that you can have an issue if a BMS fails on one of your batteries. Okay. Each one of these T-class fuses has an interrupt capacity or IC of 10,000. Okay, so 10,000 amps. So basically, jumping that arc would be very difficult to do. At a higher voltage, you could do it, but at 48 volts, which is what these are seeing, it would be difficult. I also have these terminal fuses, which will be removed. I no longer need these with these T-class fuses. These better T-class fuses here, have an interrupt of 20,000. So the way to look at it is this. These fuses protect the wires and protect the setup from a BMS failing. The T-class fuse here is to protect my inverter. If it has a short, that's when it's going to blow. The maximum that this can pull before it trips is... 300 amps and then this breaker will trip this t-class fuse is 250 so i'll never come close to pulling this much out uh, with how my setup is designed so this fuse will blow faster than this breaker will pop this should be pretty much instantaneously and it will break the arc for sure, because this has an interrupt of probably 10,000, like most breakers. This is 20,000. This is to protect against an inverter issue. And then inside of this panel, I have two T-class fuses, one for L1, one for L2. I don't have a fuse for the neutral on purpose because once again, you never want to have a floating neutral. But if there is any sort of an issue, that is going to pop long before these breakers will. If there was some sort of a major disaster with the inverters, I don't see it happening. If it did, I have T-class fuses on the output. I have T-class fuses feeding them. Makes it pretty foolproof. These inverters also have protections in them that... If it recognizes that there is an issue, either too high a current or our voltage fluctuations or just it's picking up something abnormal, it will kick off. So if it's like an overload condition or what have you, it will cut off. But I just feel better having some additional fuses as well, especially since it's going to react faster than anything else. Okay, so now configuration. As you can see, none of my batteries have any way to have them communicate with the inverters. So the way I have this set up, let me kind of zoom in so you can see this. Oh, one other thing I should mention before I get into this. Your primary inverter should always have more solar coming into it as far as wattage than your secondary. Very important. Currently, my solar panels are connected only to this inverter, but I will have different panels connected to that one, uh, the secondary. But the primary must always have more, more wattage going into it than the secondary. Okay, So as you can see, I'm pulling in 
about 2300 watts, a little bit above that. Okay, so I'm going to get into the menu here. Maybe zoom out just a little bit. And a lot of times in this menu, you'll notice that you'll need to double tap, and I'll point that out when that happens. For me, I have to choose, and hopefully you can see this, lead acid battery. If you have communications, set it up as you know, essentially that it's going to be whatever that the manufacturer is. Uh, but if it is, if there's no communication set up as lead acid, you're going to want to set up your, your capacity. So I have 1200 amp hours. I have 24, 24 volt batteries. Each one is a pair uh, to get me my 48s. So with that, that gives me 1200 amp hours. You're going to choose your battery type white right there. Okay, 1200 amp hours is correct. You're gonna hit down again, you'll see set, hit enter, hit enter again. Okay, so it's set at 1200. It's what I initially had in there, but all right, so next, gonna escape out of this menu. Let me get back in. Okay, you're gonna to go to application, press enter. If you're in the States like me, make sure both inverters say 240 volts slash 120 and that it's at 60 hertz. Here's your parallel settings. So when you scroll down to this, let me click in this, you're going to have a few options. You're going to have single phase, not parallel. So if you have one inverter, it's not parallel. And three phase. I'm single phase. If I'd hit three phase and press enter, I'd have a really bad day most likely. So single phase and then select battery shared because you're going to need that. All right, so the, once you have that set, then pretty much you have your parallel settings uh, correct. You've got your battery, that your battery shared. Then when you go to turn this on the first time, so you're going to essentially power up your first inverter. You're going to flip on your load, flip on your EPS, and flip on your solar. Give it a minute or so for it to stabilize. And then when you have the panel off and, or the panel cover off and this panel turned off, I would then turn on the second inverter, flip on the, the load, And then I would flip on the, the EPS. With both breakers turned on at your combiner panel, you're going to want to look at your waveform to see what that looks like. From what the manual states, you're supposed to have just like a single light on, see if it flickers. You can do that as an alternative, but I would rather see what the waveform looks like. And then after that, you're going to energize your, your main panel or your service panel or whatever that you have all your loads connected to. So that's pretty much it. It's, it's a pretty long video, so I apologize for that, but I wanted to make sure that I kind of went over everything. Uh, to ensure that you're doing this right. And if you're not sure at any point, definitely reach out to the company that sold it to you. Like for me, it's Signature Solar. They have a really good technical support line. You reach out to them. They'll walk you through doing the configuration. Thanks again for watching. Mike's Garage.